be paid for over here. This is, there's nothing wrong with this. Bobby, let me know when we're, are we officially live? All right, good. Evan's just complaining per usual. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in on social media for this week's TribCast. Uh, we are in our new office uh, at 919 Congress. You can send your hate mail to Evan there. Uh, and we're about to get started here, so give us a moment. Today's TribCast is presented by the LBJ Library. A new exhibit features 200 pins Secretary Madeleine Albright wore as diplomatic tools. Only at the LBJ Library, also see jewelry worn by Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson. Learn more at lbjlibrary.org. And Methodist Healthcare Ministries. Methodist Healthcare Ministries is dedicated to creating access to healthcare for uninsured and low-income families and citizens through healthcare services, advocacy, and strategic grant making. Learn more at mhm.org. Hi, this is Scott Milder, Republican candidate for Texas Lieutenant Governor in 2018. I'm looking forward to sitting down with Evan Smith of the Texas Tribune at the Austin Club next Thursday, December 7th, to talk about the race, the issues that matter to all Texans, and the future of this state. Enjoy this week's TribCast. Here's your host, Emily Ramshaw. Thank you. This is Emily Ramshaw here on the last Wednesday in November with your Texas Tribune TribCast, our weekly podcast on all things politics. Teen. I'm looking forward to sitting down with Evan Smith of the Texas Tribune at the Austin Club next Thursday, December 7th, to talk about the race, the issues that matter to all Texans, and the future of this state. Enjoy this week's TribCast. Here's your host, Emily Ramshaw. Thank you. This is Emily Ramshaw here on the last Wednesday in November with your Texas Tribune TribCast, our weekly podcast on all things politics policy. Uh, we are here in our brand new Texas Tribune offices paid for Shit by hole. Evan Smith. <laughs> right. Yeah, paid for by me. Yeah, I wrote a check. I rounded it up so that you could have nice things. CEO Evan Smith is here with us today. I'm one Grumpy of as usual. Only three men left in the media business after this morning. <laughs> oh my God. That's true. Do you count there. Garrison Keillor as being in the media business? Well, sure. He was. The Lake Woe Begone business. Wah, wah. Reporter Patrick Svitek. Good afternoon. And executive editor Ross Ramsey. Howdy. Do you have any any uh, little nudges you want to get in there? No. Did, I'm he, just did gonna, he nudge you? Am I going to have to fire him? Just going to watch. God, thank God we haven't had to deal with any of that crap Nothing. here. Exactly. Whatever other problems we have. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and right. yeah. It sucks. Yeah. Look, our Wi-Fi won't suck forever. If, however, if you'd like to come over here and fix our Wi-Fi, we could use some help. <laughs> right. Um, let, let us throw Rodney Gibbs out of a sixth floor window. He may right. jump. Yep. So let's start by talking about Joe Barton's very bad week. I'm glad that's where you went with that. <laughs> Anything that <laughs> begins like with Joe it. Barton's you know, dot, dot, dot. It was like a Trump tweet. Any <laughs> political <laughs> adventure gone anywhere. Any political adventure that begins with a naked selfie is going to end badly. I know? refer to Joe Barton's penis as Barton uh, Fink. Oh. <laughs> Ever say <laughs> Joe Barton's penis? So I was just just let me let me when I was telling the story of that st yeah, the story, that I want to have to say Joe Barton's penis over and over. So I said I'm going to refer to it as Barton Fink, and so I'm going to say, Hey, did you see You're Barton so Fink? So clever, so clever. Come on, it's like it's a jo the joke suggests itself. Uh, Evan was like doing somersaults in the office. He was so excited about our traffic being the highest it has ever been since Wendy Davis. I was convulsing. The Wendy Davis filibuster. Right. I was convulsing. And it I far surpassed the traffic then. Yeah, we got drudged. Right. Yeah. We it was pretty much everybody else was linking back to a story that, interestingly, did not contain a picture of the aforementioned Barton Fink. Yeah, because we right. would like to, you know, not, not throw TMZ up. over here. I realize that, right? So, I so mean, we'll this is... Talk to us about... Let, let's first tell our uh, listeners, if they happen to have missed it, what happened. Uh, Joe Barton apparently was in a relationship that was consensual with a woman who was not his wife, but was not not his wife in the sense that Wait. he was not married at the time, right? <laughs> he wife. was married at the time. He was separated on separated. his way to a divorce. Par pardon. So he was in a relationship with somebody in a way that was within the guardrails. He's an adult. It was consensual, all that. Mm -hmm. And he exchanged a naughty picture of himself. And a naughty right. text message. Naughty, naughty video, text apparently. Message. Right. Yes. Sounds um, like Naughty video. Right. Sounds right. like there may be more to come. And, and, you know, a, and, and, and a still from said video um, got made its way around social made media. Made its way onto social media. And, and what is legitimately true is it's a consensual relationship. While the government is on the process of outlawing everything, they haven't yet outlawed sending a picture of your naughty bits to somebody with whom you're in a relationship. Joe Barton did not, I mean, that's true. <laughs> Acknowledge Wait, it. Did you that's say true. while the government is, is on the way? 
they have not yet. Terry and Evan Smith. <laughs> and Paul Street. He's going to edit Reason <laughs> Um, No, I'm serious. I mean, that's basically the story, is that, is that it's not illegal what he did. Well, no, no. but see, In what fact, happened here was, so this picture goes out, and then... Uh, so there's the revelation of that, and Barton actually was in the first story. Abby Livingston was the first person to write about this, and the congressman was talking about it and said, I'm not sure what we're going to do here yet. Um, yeah, she called him, I mean, amazingly and he cold, answered. and right. he answered, yeah. Right. And the next story was the woman who has not been identified talking to the Washington Post about a conversation she had with Barton that I think she had on tape of him saying, you know, if you start telling all of these stories, I'm going to have to tell the Capitol Police about well, it. Well, and there is a revenge and, and porn law that is potentially right. part And this got interesting because it's not clear that he told her he was going to get the Capitol Police to do anything beyond what the Capitol Police would normally do. It's mm -hmm. not clear that he was, like, you know, swinging an official axe here. But that was the implication. So... Thank but, God but, it was an axe. But the political problem here, right. I mean, all of that's really interesting, but the yeah. political problem here is that uh, Joe Barton is now that guy in that selfie, and he's right. up for re-election, and that's really the subject of whatever's going to happen in March. So and he's every time you Google he him from here to Kingdom Come, you're going to get a TMZ article with a picture of his right. junk. You're you're beginning to get to a point where you know very very classy. He's in enough, <laughs> Mr. Barton <laughs> Fink. You're you're in. Yeah, a position, I know. Yeah. Seriously, um, I think Barton the, Fink is classier than his junk. <laughs> glass houses much? Well, you're a classier person than I am. Not, right. not, not, no. In fact, <laughs> but now they're in a position where you're, they're starting to draw right. oh, opponents. Why don't you, know, you so bring old Easter Island here into the well, conversation? He hasn't <laughs> even cracked a <laughs> smile over the He kept a pretty straight face through Come that. Come on. Yeah. So he's attracted. Well, yeah. Is definitely in doubt at this point. I think his office told reporters when this first this photo first came out that he's filed for re-election. Right. That he's you know that he's he was basically playing, he was playing on that again, track. Right? Yeah. Um. You know he had he had announced you know put out a news but release had saying not I'm running filed. for re-election yeah. earlier this month. Uh, for the record, despite what his office says, there's right now there's no evidence with the the state party or the secretary of state's office that he has actually filed. Um. I think that. He would, we yeah, we right. could see that happen in the coming days if, if it does become official. But, I mean, you're seeing in the district, you know, among Republicans there, a bit of a movement to force him out at this point. There was a statement yesterday by Tim O'Hare, who chairs the Tarrant County Republican Party, basically said Joe Barton's got to go. Uh, that came Julie McCarty, mm -hmm. head of the Northeast Tarrant mm -hmm. Tea Party. Yeah, question yeah. on Facebook Same. from Isaiah. And, it, and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram editorialized. Yeah, and, and it sounds like he's sounding out supporters and, and is, is potentially reevaluating his decision to, mm -hmm. to seek re-election. Along those lines, question on Facebook is it possible the reasons Republicans want Barton out that they see a strong Democratic challenger, uh, Jana no. Sanchez, who can beat him? No. No. No, right. I think they see some Republican challengers, and I think really their their concern is that he has some collateral effect on others on the ballot. If I was Connie Burton, mm -hmm. for example, who's running a little bit down ballot from Joe Barton, I'd be a little nervous about this. What kind of voters is he going to attract? Is it going to be the kind of voters who elect the Connie Burtons of the world? You mean, is it going to be some kind you mean of like on the Republican side, or you mean I mean in a more Democrats? I mean on the Republican <laughs> side. In a, in a, I mean both of these are safe-ish Republican districts. Barton's is very safe. Oh, Barton's is safe, and, and, not ish. and Burton's is, you know, somewhat questionable. But if, if um, you know, I, I just think that if Joe Barton is the issue, and you have to. Um, take issue with somebody else on your own ticket, then yeah. you've got some political Yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe this is common sense, but it's the Democrats' best hope for him to, to seek re-election, for him to stay in the race, right. and for this to continue right. to stay in the in the spotlight. And I he now has at least one Republican, Republican challenger, consent. correct? Right. Patrick? He yeah. has two, I believe. Two, right. One is a perennial candidate. Another one it seems a little more serious is a uh, former Jake Elzey. Air Force? Former uh, Navy, Navy fighter pilot, friends with uh, former Governor Rick Perry, unsuccessfully ran for Texas House in 2014 with Perry's backing. Naval Air Station is either in or right next to this district mm -hmm. up in Grand Prairie. Yeah, and Barton's been there for a long time. And Barton is one of these committee chair. Is he a committee chair? He is a committee chair. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. But he's not like Henseling Energy, and mm -hmm. Culberson or Henseling and Smith, rather term limited out this time not this time i think that's right right i think that's right melissa wants to know do ellis county republicans remain mom on this have they come out not yet i haven't heard anything mm. i haven't heard anything either. the ellis county republican party if i'm remembering correctly is quite spicy um didn't they crawl up jim pitts's behind at one point i mean th th this is a, an active party this is not a passive county party tyler but norris is reminding us that connie burton is not 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 running <laughs> 
What so is that chance? Mean? Not for her own seat? <laughs> no, actually, there are only three. Not, not, not. He running. means she's not running for not Congress. on the ballot this year. Right. He does mean that right. she's running for Senate. No, she is on the for ballot. She's on the ballot. She's yeah. on the ballot for yeah. Senate. Yeah, she is, yeah. is, is, is running for Senate. <laughs> for Senate. Right. right, exactly. Right. right. I um, mean, no, so I think that the local Republicans are going to make a big difference. But again, I want to point out Julie McCarty, the Tea Party, is active in that part of the mm-hmm. state, and she was very strongly. Uh, uh, as of last night, strongly in favor of Barton not running again. And I think they're going to put as much pressure as possible on Barton to get out and replace yeah. Barton with somebody. And, of course, my thinking is if, you, if Barton were not to run, presumably somebody or some bodies else will get in this race. And so here I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, Poindexter, and asking who in the legislature is in that district who is potentially a candidate for that seat. You know, the um, there are three or four people in the legislature who are relatively new. You know, I'd have to look at the... John Ray in Waxahachie presumably is in that district. Right, right. Um, Doesn't it seem kind of shitty to be forced to resign effectively over doing something that is perfectly legal? Life sucks and then you die. Part one well, million. That, yep. I was going to say, to me, that's been the most fascinating part about this is watching people, including us in the media, people in kind of the political class, trying to figure out how this fits into or doesn't fit into the current conversation right. in D.C. and other places across the I mean, country to about me, sexual has, harassment. To me, this has people, nothing you know, look, to do with right. the current conversation. This is, some, you know, consenting no, adults, sex and no. if you're a, their if private you're a cultural life. conservative, this is not the kind of behavior you're going to endorse with your vote. And that's why and, the issue and, is that Barton's political profile As Evan over the said, years. the perv vote worries about the perv yeah. voters. Well, well, but the Barton political profile <laughs> over the years. We finally found his area of expertise. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, I am oh king perv. The, the, the Barton political profile over the years tended to, tended to be contemptuous of Sodom and Gomorrah-like behavior, right? He was kind of a social conservative Yeah, he hasn't been really outspoken in, in the way that some others have. But, you know, he's from a conservative part of the state, from a very conservative, you know, Ennis... Um, Ellis County and Tarrant County are very conservative, very red parts of the state. Tarrant County is the biggest red vote producer in the state. Correct. And the only big urban area that's a red urban area. And you can't, area. you know, even if you're not a vociferous, you know, cultural conservative, you certainly can't ignore them. That's who your voters are. And I think this, you know, is a is a challenge to those voters. And if there's somebody who's an acceptable alternative to the guy whose picture is floating around on social media, it doesn't matter whether that picture is legal or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, t- to me, it's l- it's less about the behavior and more about, like, how could someone in this position, should we have someone in this position of power be this stupid? <laughs> I mean, oh, right. truly, like, that's, you know, like... This is this is some Anthony Wiener-level <laughs> shit right here. <laughs> right. You know right. this stuff have, is going to get out. I don't have to call right. Anthony Wiener's junk anything other than anthony weiner actually it's well i mean just to be clear like what anthony weiner did involved underage women it involved like putting his own child in his you know text right. messages or tweets or whatever i mean he was doing some stuff that is like not just right. plus unethical he was, plus was, he got a second chance and blew it plus right. it was also there were some younger people involved isn't that right. right that's what i just said underage. yeah they're yeah. underage so um so so can i Put, put this on less pervy ground for a moment. Hmm, sure. Ross has a column today that correctly observes that right now fully one-sixth of the Texas congressional delegation is not returning next time. Right. Six of Thank 36. You. Good pivot to our next topic. And if Barton were to <laughs> not run, it would be seven. Mm-hmm. And what's happening in a lot of these cases, not in the El Paso district, but in the Henserling seat, in the Poe seat, in the Smith seat, to name three, You have members of the legislature who are seeing a rare opportunity to move up. Mm -hmm. So there is all this dislocation and unrest and tumult politically in this cycle that is really quite interesting. Even if none of those seats changes hands from a party standpoint, there's a lot of overturning of the mulch. And most of them are not. I mean, most of these are pretty safe districts either for Republicans or Democrats. You're not going to elect a Republican in Gene Green's seat, and you're not going to elect a Democrat in Lamar Smith. But there was not intent. We were not expecting a, an opening in the legislative seat in Dripping Springs. Now, Jason Isaac has decided to not run for re-election and run for Lamar Smith. We were not expecting an open seat where Kevin Roberts is now a freshman representative. Right. And now we're seeing him run for Ted Poe. We were not expecting, you know, um, uh, other members of the legislature. I guess Ken Sheets is not a current member. But we were not expecting basically a lot of the people at the level below to suddenly be in play and therefore those seats in play. It's just interesting, I think, that we right. have all yeah. this all – this change. Just a reminder, if you have questions and comments about that change, send it our way on Facebook or Twitter, and we'll try to answer your questions. Patrick, why don't you talk to us about some of the biggest changes uh, that, that you're seeing? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously keeping a close eye on these six open congressional seats and in, in some of the ones that recently became open, even just today, you're starting to see some some real, uh, you know, action, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically, in uh, Jeb Hensterling's 5th District. He endorsed the successor, Bonnie... Uh, or, Bunny. I'm sorry, Bunny Pounds. The best and name, and best Bunny, named candidate so far. The cherry on the Sunday yeah. is that it's Bunny with an I. <laughs> She's a right. Republican right. fundraiser, Hensterling, longtime client of hers. So he backed her to replace him. Pete Sessions from the uh, neighboring congressional district uh, backed Kenneth Sheets to, to replace Hensterling in the 5th district. Um, later today, Robert Stovall, the Bear County uh, GOP chairman, is, is expected to announce his congressional campaign to uh, replace Lamar Smith in the 21st district. So really starting to see some movement uh, in these races. Um, and, you know, it's coming, obviously, toward the end of the filing period. We're more, we're more than halfway through the, the filing period. Mm-hmm. At this point, it ends on December 11th. This may catch you cold, but where was Stovall on the efforts in the Bear County Republican Party to censor censure. Censure, censure Joe Strauss? Probably like censure yeah, I don't know ob- objectively <laughs> <laughs> where he was, but I think he was the subject of some criticism by the people who were trying to make that Well, they didn't do it, right? Happen. It didn't happen. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so going back to just some of the people who aren't running again, was the Helen Giddings news a surprise? I mean, other than that it had been rumored for a few so days. I don't think so completely. I mean, she's been in the legislature right. for a long time. She served, you know, I mean, um, she was one of those people that some of the younger, ambitious people, you know, in, in South Dallas were looking at and going, mm-hmm. I wonder how long she's going to stay. Um, she's, you know, she's been there for a long time. And, and it's she's a just safe time seat, to cycle out. Oh, seat, right? sure. Very yes. safe yeah. democratic seat. But it opens up. It's one of those pent up demand seats. You so know, who runs for that seat? I'm, I'm not sure who all. I think that'll be one of those seats where you get a half dozen candidates. It'll be like when the congressional seat up there was open, and you know they had a gazillion people running. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, another one that is similarly situated but in a different place um, is Eddie Bernice Johnson mm-hmm. in, in Congress. You just kind of watch. Although she's say, announced that she's, she's running. running. Yeah. Right, but those are the kinds of seats yeah. when you have somebody with that kind of tenure and who is relatively safe in re-election. Joe Barton was in this category five right. minutes ago. Um, a lot of people look and say, you know, if that seat was open, I would run. I think you're going to see a lot of people in getting seat that you might not even have known were interested. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting. The one I'm waiting for, honestly, as we're talking about action, uh, is uh, Trey uh, Martinez Fisher getting in <laughs> against Diana Arevalo. Yep. Uh, if he, in fact, is going to run that race. Oh, he's going to have a big party to announce he's not going to do anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. So, what do we know about happens. that so far? He's basically announced. This is hype city. <laughs> he's, he's announced there will be a, a party. And there'll uh, be a big on, announcement on the, Saturday the party, in San Antonio. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Annie's list has gone ahead and proactively uh, or uh, sort of pre budded. Yeah, we received a statement and, and from Annie's list yesterday. Not, 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 yeah. yeah, not too surprising, but they're just making clear ahead of uh, TMF's anticipated announcement that they're behind Arevalo. They had supported her in 2016 right. and planned to support her As for real. he, right? I think so, yeah. And then Cheryl Cole is apparently, we are oh, Alex Samuels. She is going to uh, run against gonna run, Donna is, Duke. is filing against Donna Duke, so that's going to be an interesting Democratic primary. Look, you know, we lament in most even-numbered years the lack of competitive elections there is yeah. a delicious just, it's so yeah. great I, there's just so much going well, on the top of the ballot's boring but the but down right. in the ballot oh, come on really, what do you really got against great. trey blocker <laughs> aka I, jack diddley move move up the top of the <laughs> ticket come on jack, even more i think jack diddley has a great chance of, <laughs> of winning the eggs well i mean seat. some of those races are going to be interesting to talk <laughs> oh, about God. i think the o'rourke cruise race is going to be fun to talk about but you know it, it looks like a long well, shot. well the, the hill has pronounced <laughs> beto a rising democratic star which means he has a pulse <laughs> right so um <laughs> You know, what's, we, we, it's what the latest, located what's in Texas. the latest on the Democratic gubernatorial ticket? I think I saw one more name in the last week, one more no name in the last week. Yeah, yeah. there was a, bl- a block of cheese <laughs> with <laughs> sunglasses <laughs> propped on top of it, is getting ready to file for yeah. governor. Yeah, we reported last week that Dwight Boykins, who's a Houston City Council member, is looking at the race. You know, he joins a, a group of people who are still looking at the race that, you know, also includes Andrew White, the son of the for, uh, former governor, Mark White. And, and Andrew White seems, at this point, seems likely to, to get into the race. He's never like run for anything, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like he's leaning toward getting in the race. The Democratic ticket might as well start at the top. It's yeah. the Democratic ticket this time is going to be like a Threadgill's meal. It's going to be all <laughs> side dishes. I mean, um, there's not a freaking yeah. entree on that plate. Michael Sorrell is still looking. Paul still getting Collins. mentioned as a, as a possible candidate. I haven't seen him. Um, yeah. You know, I think you know the name. What's your name in Dallas? Yeah, the, the name Valdez, Valdez, the sheriff of yeah. Dallas County. If you had to put your money on it, I think the name to watch toward the end of the filing period here is probably Lupe Valdez. Mm-hmm. You know, the Dallas County Sheriff. Uh, you know, it's the, the 
party chairman likes her, has spoken very highly of her in ways he hasn't spoken about the other candidates. Mm-hmm. You, ha- um, you have to wonder, though, you know, if you're a Democrat with some ambition and you're kicking your dirt kicking the dirt beneath you going, I don't want to go back into the legislature and be one of 55 or 60. This is the again. Beto O'Rourke argument. I and don't want basically to go back to Congress, have, I got right? not, but because he had soft term limited, so he really had a, a cap on his Never stopped anybody there. else. Mm-hmm. But, but I, uh, true. But if you're a, a, an ambitious Democrat who can put a sentence together and thinks, look, if the Republican Party collapses from the Trump top down and all of a sudden... I have the potential to be the beneficiary of, you know, of some wave of a Sharknado. And if, in fact, um, I lose, then I, I give up the princely sum of $600 a month to go back and see my family more. What the hell? This would be a great time to get in. But if it's you're not someone a like what a the niece, hell thing. It's so much work. Yeah, but what? Yeah, but like, yeah, but you're the guy or the woman for seven or eight, nine months running for governor. You also ran. To I mean, me, there's it. two. There are two kind of people who do that. One of them is like a Kevin Roberts who has not been in here long enough to qualify for these lucrative um, retirement benefits, yeah. and on the other end, people who have been in long enough to, re- you know, that. They've qualified. They've got their tenure, right. which is 10 years, and they've decided, what the heck, I'm going to go ahead and roll the dice. Let me, let me slide into Erica Greeter's DMs here for a second, okay? <laughs> and let me let me make the argument that she's made. Well, that, <laughs> that sounded sure. pervy. Yeah. No, no. I was quite Everything specific after about Martin what King I meant. sounded pervy. Yeah. So the, the former Texas Monthly and now Houston Chronicle political writer who has been promoting actively on Twitter about 75% seriously, Pancho Navarro's running for governor. She thinks Pancho Navarro, she's enamored of his talent she thinks that he's a talented state rep who can be you know make a fist and can i guess he can he made a fist in a literal sense right <laughs> yeah. but but who is in a position to be a forceful advocate for democratic values and principles and, and all that you know for someone like him like what's the upside to being in a legislature where the speaker's office is about to be occupied by somebody who's going to be less inclined rather than more inclined to make you a vice chair you're kicking around the party, you know, that the party that is in the vast minority in the House, unless you have some belief that that's all going to change in the way that the Virginia House of Commons just changed. You're heading back into another two-year cycle. Your kids are not getting any younger. You're going to miss another two years of Ponchito growing up without you <laughs> being there. Run for governor. Lose honorably. Why run the ru- campaign and then get the hell back to Eagle Pass. This is the Eric Agreed. There's no reason to run a race you think you're going to lose. Unless you're trying to make your name for Well, then why another, should anybody well, then run? you're not making your name for another race. I mean, you run a race you because think you think White you have a chance to win it. No, but, you know, six years ago, there was no way Ted Cruz was going to win a race against David Dewhurst. I mean, you look at a race and you say, if this and this and this, and if you, you know, maybe a high-risk deal, maybe a low-percentage shot, but if you can see a way to beat Greg Abbott, then you get in that race. You and think Ted Cruz saw a way to beat David Dewhurst? I do. And, I, and he explained it before that race began. I sat down at a table with him, and he ran out, ran his business plan out. Um, he was partly basing it on Dewhurst's right. flaws as a candidate. If you're Navarra's or anybody, you look at this and you say, how would you beat Greg Abbott? A, is that possible? Is there a single and Democrat can, who can make that argument? If you can answer that question, then you move to the next one. Okay, am I in a position to take that risk? Uh, speaking of losing well, by honorably, the way, uh, can we just point one thing out. Svitek sure. told me today, who has not yet filed for re-election to Congress? Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee and Joaquin Castro. It is the latter well, I'm interested in for yeah. the purposes of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so there's hope. Really there's always hope. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Like, like, <laughs> no, no. But the point is, so Joaquin <laughs> Castro, Joaquin Castro has not filed for re-election to Congress. <laughs> Right. Got to answer the first question. At least not according to the Secretary of State's website. He could have filed with the uh, local authorities. But wouldn't they have let you know since you've been sniffing around? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the point is, he was a rumored potential candidate. Joaquin Castro on line one. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, right. Joaquin, if you're listening. (laughs) (laughs) You know, what I'm interested with the the governor's race is assuming one of these more high profile, like a Lupe Valdez, uh, does get in. You know, know, for all their obscurity and all the, the jokes, you know, people like Jeffrey Payne and Tom Wakely have. Have been doing work for the mm-hmm. past several months. They right. have been going around the state. Right. They've been talking to groups. They've been trying to organize. Um, I don't think they're going to step aside easily mm-hmm. uh, in a Democratic primary. And I think they're going to they're going to. Yeah, but aren't they like the Chris Dodd of that presidential primary? I mean, you're going to end up with your two percent, and then you're going to endorse somebody else, and you're going to hope for to get an appointment. Well, maybe or maybe not in a Democratic primary. I mean, how do you do in a Democratic yeah. primary? I'm just saying they're mm-hmm. not. You know, they're not wholly irrelevant. Yes, well, honestly, given the fact that the talent pool is pretty. Uh, kind of kiddie level 
for the party this year at the gubernatorial race and why not pain or wakely i mean you know we've had scenarios where a person got in a race and we thought oh they're going to be the one and then they had the wrong surname right. over the years right? right that's happened sure and all of a sudden stephen wayne smith's on the supreme court right right so you know i don't know jeffrey payne and tom wakely are perfectly good ballot names we don't know who else is going to run right I mean, it could you could end up lucking into getting the nomination, or Grady Yarborough, who got that nomination for railroad commission last time by by just being on the ballot. He, by the way, is running for governor also, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. It's first to file. Right. All right it, well, you it, killed it is kind my... of the bar scene in Star Wars. I mean, that's I the problem for them right now. Is it's just an extraordinary collection of people running, and it's not really. I mean, would you agree? You've been around longer than any of us. This is the worst democratic cycle for candidate recruitment at the statewide ticket level that I've ever seen in 13 sessions. Ask, 20, again, 20, ask again in two weeks. Maybe there's a miracle. But what if so it doesn't far, change? If it doesn't change, it sucks. Is it the worst? I'll have to go look. There have been some bad ones. I mean, you know, there have been some stinkers back Hashtag <laughs> nostalgic for Barbara Radnofsky. Right. I mean, seriously. Right. I was going to use the losing honorably transition, but now I'm just going to use Ross's sucks transition <laughs> to uh, help. talk about Kevin Sumlin. <laughs> Ten, uh, ten million dollar buyout. But before we nice do that, if you oh, can get it. I need to remind you if you're listening um, and using iTunes, please consider reviewing us and subscribing. Uh, here's a recent review from I'm the Q. The Trib Guest is my favorite podcast. It features experienced journalists analyzing Texas state politics with some occasional irreverent humor. I think it's more than occasional, <laughs> more than irreverent. I enjoy the unique perspective each of the regulars brings to the table, and I look forward to the show each week. All right, that's a good one. We didn't even pay her for it. Uh, speaking of paying people. Then <laughs> let's talk about Kevin Sumlin. What? He got paid $10 million for what? John Sharp finally got his wish. Bounce so that guy. How does this even happen? I mean, how do you have a deal like that where you get to not work for two years and you get paid? $10 well, and in fact, even if you, unlike Charlie Strong, if someone gets a new job, they don't get to reduce their payout. Wouldn't Charlie Strong also get $10 million? Contracts are always made by regents in an exuberant and generous mood. So Charlie Strong got a payout, so, but he got a new job, and that reduced the payout. So right ah. now, Texas A&M is talking to new coaches, and whoever it turns out to be, they're in such a great mood, and they think the new coach is going to win all the games, and they're going to give them whatever that coach wants, and they're going to write a very favorable contract that lures the coach in today, and it looks really phenomenally stupid in five years. Ann asks on Facebook, one would think there would be a lawyer available to give contract advice to A&M, right? Who writes these contracts? That's well, a Ray, really is it great Ray question. Bonilla? Who was the general counsel of the system? I don't know. I don't know that it goes up to the system. I don't know that this. I don't know where this. Is it got, Ray, Bonilla, Ray Bonilla, the general Ray counsel? Ray Bonilla is the general counsel for the system, but I don't know if this went to the system. If this got, you know which booster or regent or department was involved in it. But, you know, it, may, it seems like they keep signing these contracts and they find flaws in them, you know, at the exit point. It seems like they would sort of standardize that. And, Sumlin you know. did not have a losing season as the A&M coach. They just... Right? It, right. It, the problem is that the expectations and the, and the d demands, candidly, from fans and, and from alums and boosters specifically are so high, both at A&M and at UT, but at a lot of schools, that... Pretty good. It's just not good enough. So who pays? Uh, where does this money come from? It's mostly local funds. I mean, it mostly and that's the the what phrase for stuff that doesn't come mm. straight from taxpayers, but comes from ticket holders and, and five and cents like from every beer consumed at the Dixie right. Chicken goes to pay for the salary. Right. At a school like Texas A and M or a school like UT for football, the program is is you know internally prof operationally profitable. Mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about you know other things, you know baseball and, and women's sports and, and some other things like that, unless they're phenomenally successful programs, they don't pay for themselves, but you can pay for it out of, uh, you know, profits from the more lucrative sports like football and, and men's basketball. I mean, so there isn't any argument that this money should be going toward things like academics? Sure, there's an argument. <laughs> I sure. mean, I mean, it, every academy in the, in the country has that argument. So how, do, how is this still a thing? How are these guys paid this much money? It's not the pros. It's crazy to it me. It's the pros. It's, it's, it's not only is it the pros, it's in some respects better than the pros. You know, what is the name of the guy who's going to coach at my daughter's school from the Eagles, who is the He's someone from the yeah. Eagles? Chip, Chip Kelly. Is that his name? I Chip I, Kelly? I oh, He's going to go be the new U, U, UCLA coach, right? Jim Harbaugh went from the NFL back down to coach at Michigan. Lou Saban. In some ways, the, the, um, the, the college football coaching opportunities are more attractive than, I mean, just ask Trump. The NFL sucks. 
right? Kevin Sumlin, after he gets over his hard feelings, you know, he's got enough money to buy a pretty nice house. Is he going to go to Arizona State? I don't know where he ends up. Arizona State's been talked about. And you know. in the meantime, Jimbo Fisher, which is a great name. I hope that's his actual name right. as opposed to his nicknames. Parents right. had a sense of humor and named him Jimbo. Jimbo, Jimbo Bob. Is is being talked about as a potential A&M coach. We don't know Florida if he'll State. actually be. But he's Jimbo? A, Jimbo Fisher. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't Jimbo sound like a good name for a coach in College Station? Jimbo? Yeah. Yes. Rolls right off the tongue. It does. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, Patrick, can you fill us in on what Greg Abbott did this <laughs> week? Talk more about sports. <laughs> <laughs> Please, yeah. no. Northwest. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Jay Z, <laughs> Dean Beck, K stuff, right. we're all over that. I think actually. Northwestern's actually having a decent season. Maybe. No, they're having a sure. very good season. Yeah. So oh, this maybe is sad. All of a sudden, I'm outnumbered <laughs> by. Mook. This is Mook's something from, that he Mook's should the know. The, at least know the Northwestern football <laughs> stuff, man. All right, really quickly talk no, to us I'm, about Greg yeah, Abbott really and Willett. The, 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 the Medill <laughs> football team sucks, by the way. Uh, yeah, Abbott uh, held a press conference uh, on Monday Top to announce. Top secret press yeah. conference. <laughs> a lot of mystery and suspense leading up to word, it. Right. Yeah, um, and he announced that he's going to be uh, appointing uh, Jimmy Blacklock, who is the general counsel in his office, a longtime uh, legal advisor to him, both in the governor's office and also an advisor in the uh, attorney general's office. He's going to be appointing Blacklock to replace Don Willett on the Texas Supreme Court once Willett is presumably... If, if and when. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, if, if and his when... tweets don't become a problem. Willett is confirmed to the uh, federal bench. Abbott said that based on his conversations with Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, he, he, they expect Willett to be confirmed in, in December, so by the end of this year. Um, but there's a, you know, Ross probably knows more about this than I do, but there's a really unique timeline here in Abbott, I think, was trying to get ahead of some potential political jockey. I think he threw a pretty sharp elbow at Rick Green, who's been mm -hmm. a perennial candidate, a former member of the Texas House He's from Dripping Springs. He's a Republican, so, uh, social conservative, and he had already previously declared run, for this race. Previously run for the Supreme Court. Previously yeah. run for Supreme Court. Uh, he had already declared for this, and as part of the Abbott announcement said, oh, I think that'd be a good pick. I'm going to get out of the way. So I yeah. think... You know, Abbott uh, preempted that um, possibility. You know, the one possibility here was that anybody could file for Willett's seat, which Willett himself has filed for. and In the event if, he's not confirmed. And right. Yeah, he's up for re-election. And if um, Willett, you know, gets the Fifth Circuit job, that person would be the last person standing. Right. And yeah. Abbott said the next person standing is going to be Blacklock. Yeah, and I guess it's important to explain to our listeners – even one singular <laughs> listener, yeah, listener. Tyler, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tyler, <laughs> Tyler, Tyler, listen up. Oh, come on. Assuming, there are a few of them. assuming the Jimmy Blacklock appointment goes through <laughs> as Kobe Abbott plans it to anymore. be, Blacklock has to run for a permanent term or full term right. in 2018, just like Willett would have had to run for that. And Abbott made clear at this press conference that he has he's in, going to be endorsing Blacklock for that 2008 uh, eventual theoretical 2018 campaign and he's going to campaign right. not so, yet so knowing who else is yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. not yet knowing yeah. who else is potentially going to run for that seat but yeah. presumably if the Every, governor everybody else is going to be a sarah davis in that race yeah. <laughs> all right well that's all the time we have this week if you're listening uh, if you like listening to the tribcast please do us a favor and leave us a review on itunes and if you value the tribune's nonprofit nonpartisan newsroom which we hope you do please consider making a donation at support.texastribune.org thanks to shiny ribs for our music and on behalf of evan ross patrick and our producer Producers Todd and Bobby. This is Emily. Thanks for listening. And if you joined us on social media today, thanks for following along, and we'll see you here next week. <laughs>